Welcome to The Divorce Podcast, a podcast that aims to address divorce, separation and co-parenting here in the UK, countering the often sensationalist way it's portrayed in the media, challenging the status quo and driving for reform. On each episode, I'm joined by experts to discuss divorce, separation and co-parenting from different angles and to give their opinions and to debate them. I'm Kate Daly, a relationship counsellor and divorce coach, co-founder of Amicable, the divorce services company, and host of this, The Divorce Podcast. In this episode, I was joined by Clive Coleman to discuss the introduction of no-fault divorce, the media narrative around it, and future reform in the divorce space. As the BBC's legal correspondent between 2010 and 2020, Clive was the face and voice of legal coverage and analysis across the BBC, radio, television, and the website. His background in law as a practicing barrister has fed into his journalism. Prior to his work with the BBC, he was a presenter for a number of years, and Clive is also an acclaimed writer for theatre, television and film, most recently The Duke, based on a real-life legal drama. He's also been through his own divorce, which we talk about in this episode. We look specifically at how the media have previously covered divorce, its responsibility in sparking change, as well as future reform. Clive responds to the criticism around no-fault divorce from religious groups, and we both agreed that Amicable is well-placed in offering information and guidance around the new laws and no-fault divorce. If you really loved this episode or want to hear more episodes like this, then please make sure to rate us on your preferred listening platform. Enjoy the episode. Welcome, Clive. Thank you. Nice to be here. Oh, it's lovely to see you, and thank you very much for taking the time to come and speak to us on the podcast. Now, I mentioned in my intro that you've had an illustrious career as a journalist, now turned film writer, but you started out as a barrister. Can you just tell us a little bit about your background, Clive, and how you came to be the BBC's legal correspondent? Yeah, I can. I mean, I've had a ridiculously varied career, none of which I in any way planned. So I I did an English degree at York University a long, long time ago and didn't really know where that was going to get me in terms of any sort of gainful employment. So I decided I'd become a barrister or try and become a barrister, I think largely because my dad had always loved the, the courts and and been fascinated by you know the law and and I think had wanted to become a barrister actually back in those days he was came from a very humble background and and you know it cost money to become a barrister and he didn't have the money and uh, you know he never sat me down and said I really want you to become a barrister but I think that that influence and you know we went to courts together and he actually became a patent lawyer and uh, was in fact you know in, in his heydays he was instructing some of the the best and the most brilliant at the pattern bar. I also quite like the idea of, of a job where you could just get up and, and talk. Uh, all the time, <laughs> the only thing I felt I had any talent for whatsoever. So um, yeah, so I, I did that and I converted, did a law conversion course and was called to the bar in 1986. And did you specialise in a particular area of law then? No, I did a lot of things really badly. I was in a general <laughs> common law set of chambers. I did anything that came through the door. I did, um, you know, uh, some low-level uh, cr- criminal work, prosecution of prosecuted for the CPS a bit, and defence work. And uh, the chambers was mainly sort of personal injury and medical negligence chambers. Mm-hmm. So I did a, a bit of that. But I was only in practice for about four years, and uh, I decided to leave because I actually wanted to become a comedy writer. And the only right. way I could work. I actually I started writing some sketches and I sent one into Spitting Image and it, and they put it on and and I thought oh well I'd really like to have a go at this and I remember going and talking to the clerk in my chambers and saying you know I really would like to you know, be a comedy writer you, I'm, I think I'm going to try and run the two careers together what do you think he said I don't think you I don't think you could or you should and I think you should leave <laughs> or words to that effect Worse than that effect. So I, it's actually, so I, there's quite a, there's quite a link, isn't there? If you think about it, I suppose as a barrister, you're up on your feet and you're acting to some extent apart in a courtroom theatre, aren't you? And then to yep, to make that leap to sort of television and presenting information and and la- the aspect of language and everything else. I, I guess the link is there, isn't it? If you look for it. Definitely. And, you know, in fact, people sometimes say what's more terrifying being, you know, a barrister standing up, let's say, in the 
court of appeal and getting your arguments dismantled limb by limb by three brilliant judges or or you know or being a live broadcaster and the answer is being a live broadcaster because <laughs> if you get it wrong in the court of appeal you know 30 people get to hear about it but if you yeah. get it wrong on the uh, on the 10 o'clock news it's more like five million so that is more nerve-wracking yeah. but yeah no a lot of barristers you know they have that sort of performing gene uh, clearly mm-hmm. and uh uh, you know, a lot of them are you know, sort of actors, Monke, I think, somewhat. So, yeah, the th- the two things are connected. And quite a few people have tunneled out from the bar into, you know, performing in, in one way or another. So you you made this leap. So you, you sacked yourself from Chambers and, and went to be a, a, a comedy sketch writer. How did you get well, I, I sort of did it back to the BBC? Yeah, no, I, well, the, actually, the, what happened was that I decided I, I, could, I couldn't sort of just leave because, I, you know, I wasn't making any real money. I was getting the odd sketch on television and radio, but I wasn't really making any money. So I became, um, I taught at the Inns of Court School of Law. I taught barristers. Okay. And I did that for a long time, actually, for, you know, getting on for 10 years. Um, and it was great because it was a teaching year. So it gave me lots and lots of time to write comedy. And also I had a ready-made audience of students. Yeah, my lectures were without doubt the worst lectures in the entire institution, but they were quite well attended just because I was trying out a lot of material. It was entertaining. Yeah, the most entertaining. It was quite entertaining, I think. Um, but um, yeah, so I did that. And it's funny, actually, because when I then became a journalist, I, I was sort of sitting in court covering cases thinking, God, I, I, taught, the, I taught the junior barrister and the, so I caught the taught the QC, and then now uh, several of the students that I uh, I'm, sh- I'm ashamed to say, well, not ashamed to say, but I, it's a mark of my age that several of the students that I taught are now high court judges. <laughs> so, wow. You know, some of them managed to get over whatever misinformation I'd imparted over those years, and, wow. and actually have really good careers in the law. <laughs> which I'm pleased pleased that they did. That was brilliant. So you went from teaching, and then from teaching barristers to back to the BBC or how did that yeah I I mean I was so so when I was teaching I was also writing and I wrote a sitcom about barristers for Radio 4 and then it was on BBC One called Chambers starring John Bird and Sarah Lancashire and I so I was writing but Chambers had two series on television then rather it didn't get recommissioned for a third series and it was a a bit like sort of slightly falling off a cliff in that it was great whilst I was doing it. And then, Mm. you know, you have to start again from nothing. And at that point I was teaching and I taught um, a fantastic woman called Innes Bowen who worked for the BBC and um, she phoned me up in 2004 because they were, I mean, she, she qualified as a barrister, but then gone to work for the BBC. They were looking for a new presenter for law and action on radio four. And I managed by hook or crook to get that job. And I did that for six years between 2004 and 2010. And then sort of managed to parlay that into becoming the the BBC legal correspondent. So it was really through, you know, through through having left the bar to write comedy that I sort of came into contact with someone who was able to give me an introduction to the BBC. Wow. And so when you were the, the BBC's law correspondent, that must have taken you into some very interesting and diverse areas of the law. Yeah, I mean, it was the most fantastic job. I, you know, I, I mean, my brief was that really that wide. It was the law. I mean, I worked within the Home Affairs Unit and the Home Affairs correspondents were, you know, covered the police, prisons, terrorism. There were some things I, did, I, tend, I didn't cover that the area involved the law that, that they covered. But I covered pretty much the whole of the civil law and obviously large aspects of the criminal law. So it was a massive brief. And yeah, it was, it was just a, a fantastic job. I mean, I think people are, are very interested in the law, but they, they find it complicated. They find it o- opaque, difficult. And and I, you know, my job was... Well, I was going to say dull and dry, and you must have brought a bit of sparkle to it then. <laughs> well, I think that the, the thing that I tried to do was just to make it clear and understandable. Mm-hmm. And the best feedback I, I got was when if people said, yeah, it was, you know, it was really clear, really got that, you know, because it is critical the law it affects everyone's lives and people want to know it and understand it but they needed parts of it explained because it, you know it's just it's, it's just not that easy to grasp so that was always my goal you know like a good jury advocate you know you were always looking for a way to unlock a, a, an issue that affected people's lives with a with a good image or a good phrase and that was you know that's part of the scale I mean you listen to some of the fantastic you know kind of my colleagues at the BBC who are just brilliant. I mean, they, you know, they, they have that facility to find those phrases and those images and to 
and also you're telling a story often in in mm-hmm. no time at all. I, mean, I used to do a lot of pieces for the Radio 4 1800 bulletin, which I love as my favorite bulletin um, in broadcasting. And they were kind of essays in a minute. You know, they they yeah. they were proper essays with a beginning, a middle and an end. But you only had a minute to write them and, and, and tell them. And so you, you become very adept at using language with enormous economy and, and, and just brushing out spare words and phrases and mm. just writing very clearly. It's a great discipline from, from that point of view, actually. You mentioned just as you were speaking then that, you know, the law is often very opaque and difficult for people to, normal people, to navigate. And that's certainly something, you know, we've talked a lot about on the podcast. You've been divorced yourself. What, what's been your experience of navigating a legal issue when it's a personal one, you know, as an, as an individual, as somebody who's, you know, facing stuff for the first time? I think I've yet to meet a couple who have said, well, you know, our divorce was the most wonderful thing that ever happened to us. It was the most positive experience in our lives. You know, it is just a very, very difficult time, particularly when there are children uh, involved and as mm-hmm. they were with us. So it, it was difficult. It was challenging. I mean, I, I, so I had a lawyer actually, but I I said to my lawyer, look, you know, I can do most of this myself, and I did yeah. I did ninety percent of the of the work. Well, that's so interesting. Just wanted... why did you have a lawyer then? Because you like you say you could do it yourself. What made you go and get a lawyer? I think just to have a little bit of distance and a little bit of space and and perspective. You know, it, it, it was. Uh, you know, we we tried mediating for various reasons that that didn't work for us, and in the end, we we both had lawyers. And you know, I have to say, we weren't managed to go through the whole thing. Really, I think with the minimum in terms of because you know, some divorce couples or divorcing couples literally can't be in the same room, can't mm-hmm. you know, and, and it's it's really really difficult. And I you know, I know I know why that can be. But we tried very hard and I think we managed quite well through that process to continue talking, particularly in relation to the boys. And, you know, nobody slagged anyone off. And, you know, we've managed to maintain really very good relations post-divorce, which I'm really proud of, actually. And Yeah, and, you and should be proud lot. of it. Mm. You know, because, it's not, you know, it's, it's, not, it, it's tough when, you know, you're kind of being sort of ripped apart you know, emotionally, financially, you know, you're having to rehouse, you're having to rethink your entire life. You know, you 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 want to be as good a parent as you possibly can be, but you can't be a parent in quite the same way because you're not going to be physically there, all that sort of stuff. It's really, really difficult. And, you know, I, as a journalist, I was constantly being parachuted into legal situations where people were dealing with very, very difficult problems. But it is, mm-hmm. as, as you your questions indicates when it's you it's it's a completely different different kettle of fish and mm. uh, you know. so do you do you think you had any advantage given your background then i i mean advantage as in you could navigate it better for yourself rather than advantage <laughs> over anybody but did it help or did it hinder i probably helped i think because i wasn't starting from i wasn't sort of feeling my way in the dark i, I you know i i knew i knew the, the law of divorce and i knew sort of mm. the process Having said that, you know, the process at, at times is so difficult. And, you know, I remember the, the dreaded form E, which is this form oh, gosh, that we all have yeah. to fill out that, you know, where you have to note down every bit of money or, you know, investment or property, or whatever that you've got. And, yeah, we didn't have a vast amount, but it was in so many different places. And, you know, I think this for me was, I, I honestly think it was a sort of the love child of a, an accountant and a psychopath. I mean, it, it took me like <laughs> about a week to fill it in and it reduced me to tears. And if there is an area for divorce re- law reform, I think, you know, t- uh, providing something that is a bit more user friendly and easier to negotiate and navigate than that, that would certainly be a good start. Because, you know, your, you know, your main focus is on your family and your children and, you know, your relationship going forward. And, you know, and suddenly you're having to deal with, you know, this kind of labyrinthine, you know, and everyone said, oh, that for me is in a total nightmare. And mm. um, they were all right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's it's really difficult. And that's definitely one of the things that at Amical we've tried to do. We've got um, a much nicer way of collecting your financial information that hopefully doesn't spark, you know, too much antagonism between people. We've worked really hard in trying to find 
simple ways for collecting that data in because when you've got everything else working against you as well when you're emotionally drained and as you say you've got a to-do list as long as your arm in terms of rehousing and resorting everything out none of that waits does it it's all happening to you at the same time exactly and you're trying to find you know building society paying in books from 15 years ago yes exactly yeah <laughs> or those dreaded child trust fund accounts that, uh, that yeah. the Labour government bought in and then i've just yeah exactly, trying to find those yeah. is a killer for me <laughs> Checking whether that piggy bank in the back of the cupboard still there. <laughs> yes. yeah. It's um yeah, that's that's that sort of thing doesn't doesn't help the process. But you know, we 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 managed to get through it then. And uh yeah. we, you know, we we uh, I certainly think that when I was able to rehouse, because I actually went back and lived with my parents for a period. Not uncommon, is it? No, not uncommon. Um, and I was lucky they were they were great parents and it was nice, actually very nice to spend time with them, but I don't think they quite <laughs> thought that the age 50 was uh, was yeah. going to be coming back and staying with them for quite a long time <laughs> I was joked with them that when I when I went back and you know I was, I was very sensitive and that you know, got them both together in the kitchen and said to them look you know I you know, for as long as I'm here really genuinely I, w- I want you to treat the place as if it's your own yeah um, <laughs> <laughs> Don't mind me. <laughs> it, was, it was their own. Um, oh. but, <laughs> that was, it was, there, were, there were positive aspects to that, but, you know, you, you don't really want to, um, yeah. at that point in your life, particularly go, <laughs> go back and live with your parents. No. Um, you said just a minute ago that, you know, you had felt that because you knew how the legal system worked and, you know, you, were, you understood the divorce laws, that that had made things slightly more simple for you. Does that mean realistically that we should be doing more to get some of that basic information out there to people so that if, you know, something awful and a divorce happens, that there is better public information for people? Because it strikes me that if you can start a divorce off in the right way with some decent neutral information, then you've got a much better chance of navigating successfully rather than, you know, coming at it from a position of no knowledge and not really understanding the parameters or how it all works. Yeah, no, I think there are absolutely. I mean, I think now, you know, in the kind of online world, people have relatively easy access to some pretty good resources in terms of, you know, introductory guides to divorce and walking people through the process. But yeah, I mean, I think there is an argument for a number of areas of law, you know, to maybe may be covered in citizenship classes or or whatever at, at, at schools, because it is really important. I think, you know, there'll be arguments against, you know, putting divorce into the school curriculum. <laughs> yeah. Some people wouldn't think that was very appropriate. But I think um, I've always thought that, you know, people say a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. I think that's nonsense. I think a little knowledge is a good thing and a bit more knowledge is a better thing. And a lot of knowledge is, is a really good thing. You know, I think going in completely blind to something as difficult and complicated and important as a divorce is is kind of terrifying. So anything mm. that reduces but that the- is the experience of most people, isn't it? You go into it totally blind and without any experience or without any, you know, the experience I guess many of us have is that we've known somebody who's divorced and then we're suddenly thrown it into into it ourselves. So I think it's it sounds like you know getting that information into people's minds and having some public information about it would certainly help to keep things a lot more amicable well, and you, you know, you know, if on, you're on any journey you need co you know you you want coordinates don't you i mean yeah. and and the divorce is a difficult journey and um the more you can you have in the way of coordinates and a route map the less stress you will feel i think so i agree with you i think you know at, at the outset you know i think any good lawyer or advisors like yourselves would be giving people a sense of the kind of route map the journey and giving them the security of knowing that uh, first of all it's a journey with an end <laughs> you know um, and yes. there are goals and all that sort of stuff and yeah all that sort of help is invaluable really mm. and what role do you think the media has to play in that sort of narrative around divorce because you know we've come i think we've come through quite a change in the last few years i think the language around divorce in the media that has been very conflict-based. It's been a lot about battles and entitlements and fights. And I think we're just starting to see a change in that language. What role do you think the media has to play in how normal people perceive divorce and how they approach divorce? Well, I mean, I think that, you know, it depends which part of the media you're, you're, you're 
thinking about but i mean you know certain parts of the media love you know the sort of the sort of big divorce stories the big money divorces the the acrimonious divorces the you know the stars who get divorced all that sort of stuff what i think is really interesting about no fault divorce which i have to say i think is a very very welcome change in in our law is that you know it, it will reduce for so many people the the pain the acrimony um, you know, it, it just has always struck me as crazy, really, that mm. when you're you are being torn apart as a as a couple and as a family, you know, and sometimes it's absolutely nobody's fault. You know, people fall out of love, things mm. happen. You know, at that point, to have to then sit down and work out, you know, who's going to blame the other person, and to just put the sort of toxic element of blame into the whole process, just struck me as always as being you know just very undesirable and i think it's a really positive move now that in england and wales there there will be a system of no fault divorce and i think it will make it a lot easier for a lot of couples divorce is never going to be easy but it will make it easier than you know having to apportion blame you were the unreasonable one you acted unreasonably you know in most divorces both parties at various times have acted unreasonably <laughs> in my experience and so, yeah, I, I, I think it's a very, very positive change in the law. I think, um, mm. I'm quite excited about it. Actually. Yeah, me too. But not everybody's positive about it. There are still some factions, aren't there, that feel that it makes divorce too easy, that it, you know, sticks the knife into marriage and all of those sorts of things. What, what do you say to that? I just don't really agree. I just don't think any couple get divorced, you know, for any reason other than there's a very you know they're, they're very unhappy together you know mm. and so you know i don't think it's something people just you know they get married i think we'll be able to get divorced easily i just don't people no, no one thinks that way in in my experience i think there are some people who have religious you know uh, objections to the the law change and i can understand i can understand that perspective i just think that you know as i say in my experience most people unless you know it, it is slapping you in the face like a wet fish every day that you are very unhappy as a couple mm. you don't get divorced and once you get to, to the position where you you know you realize that that really is the best option for moving on uh, you know as a couple as you know people a family then the easier you can make it uh, in in terms of separating and making sure you make the best possible arrangements and focus on all the right things, which is making the best living arrangements for your children, uh, accommodation arrangements for yourselves, financial arrangements, so that uh, people are are because uh, you know essentially you're halving your wealth when you get divorced mm -hmm. in most cases. So you know it's a it's a it's a big deal, and you know creating the right environment. And, you know, cooperation is absolutely critical in that process. And if you're having to sit down and blame each other, it just works against, you know, cooperating, I think, and, and doing the whole thing in a very civilised way. To the no-fault divorce, will they make a big enough change, do you think, in terms of, like, they're going to, it's going to stop the blame, so it's, it's potentially going to start, help people start divorce off on the right foot, but then there are children issues and financial issues that aren't touched by these laws. So how do you think reform of those areas will come about? And what role do you think the media has to play in bringing about those changes? Well, yeah, um, well, we mentioned the dreaded for me. I certainly think that the sort of financial ancillary relief uh, regime uh, could do with a, a good review and overhaul as far as Children arrangements concerned. I mean, we were very fortunate. I mean, we both agreed on co-parenting right from the get-go, and we, we we've stuck to that. So I I haven't been at the sharp end of you know difficulties in terms of you know contact and and, and supervised contact or all that that mm. sort of stuff. But I know that you know there are many families that that have really struggled with that, and you know various the various organisations. Families need fathers and, and and others that feel that there's uh, you know need for you know serious need for for reform in in those areas. And do you as think the media can play a role in that though? So do you, what happens to get 
you know, from an issue that just the professionals are talking about to something that actually, you know, hits the public imagination and gets support. And then how does that turn into a a bill uh, and a, an act of parliament? Yeah, I mean, the, the media, obviously, you know, one of the jobs I felt I had at the BBC was to shine a light on, you know, issues, malfunctioning of the justice system. Mm. So that people, and once people become more aware of it, then the pressure for change and reform can grow. So, you know, when lawyers were telling me things were going wrong, whether it's in the immigration system, the family system, or, or wherever, then you know, you, you were very keen to do stories on that to bring it to to mass attention. So, in that sense, that that that's really what the media is is there for. Um, and so, of course, it has a role to play. And you know, politicians do listen to the media. And they take it they 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 take it pretty seriously. That's the way you know they communicate with the public. And you know, the, the, I think the media, on a you know, often does a very good job in holding you know lawmakers to to account and, and and directing them in the direction of areas of the law that are not working or or, or need review. So yeah, it's got that ongoing brief. Mm. But if the media and um, yeah, I'm using the broad brush term of the media, but if the media like the more sensationalist way things are reported, how do you get a good story without making it sensationalist? Because, you know, two people coming together to do an amicable divorce isn't such a good scoop as, you know, Fiona Shackleton getting a glass of water chucked over her head in, in a court. You know, you can see the two extremes there, but how do, how do we persuade the media to come with us on the journey for judicial reform and change in the family divorce laws? Well, I mean, I think you're right that people like drama and they like, you know, they like stories that are, you know, sort of uh, have an element of drama and confrontation to them. And you're never going to stop the media running those kind of stories. But um, so here's, here's the thing that I always bear in mind in relation to any story. I kind of think almost any Anytime you open your mouth, you're telling a story. Certainly when you're broadcasting, you're telling a story. When you're in court, you're telling a story. So William Golding, who, uh, you know, the famous writer who wrote The Lord of the Flies, I remember him being interviewed and him saying that, you know, if you have a screaming toddler who's sort of blue in the face, incandescent with rage, won't listen to reason at all. If you sit them on your knee and you say once upon a time and you say it in the right way, you know, you've got them. And I, I kind of think if you say once upon a time, in the right way to any audience, you've got them. And, you know, if you said in relation to a good news story, if you like, in inverted commas, or a story that isn't about conflict, you know, it, it's up to the journalist and the media organisation to work out a compelling way to tell those stories. I mean, you know, I, and not all of the stories I did as a journalist were about warring factions or, you know, high profile people slugging it out in the courts by any means. And some of the best stories were, you know, positive stories that, you know, where things that were problems were, you know, sort of sorted out, actually. And sometimes our coverage really helped with that. You know, it, it, and so it's not just reserved for, you know, the Johnny Depp and Amber Heard type cases. Um, there are plenty of issues that people are genuinely interested in. And if you get the narrative right, you you take them with you and they will understand it. And then they will, if they feel strongly about it, they'll want something done. And I think you're right. It's the language that's so important, isn't it? When we started off by talking about language and the importance of language, and it's kind of we're coming sort of almost full circle to it. It's the language that you use to speak about what's happening and it can be colourful and it can be interesting without it being hateful or acrimonious or conflict-ridden. I think that's such an important change and it goes across all of the different ways that even the government communicates as well. I mean, you look at the government website, gov.uk, which is the most trusted site that people go to when they're getting a divorce. And that's factually incorrect at the moment. It doesn't lay out in the correct language all of the different options people have for divorcing in an amicable way. It's still rooted in a traditional system of lawyers and everything else. And I think as now everybody can say anything and we've got this proliferation of media and everybody's a broadcaster and we've got all these different channels, having certain sources where you've got really well-crafted language 
that just sets the tone for how you want people to behave and to change. I think it's so incredibly important. I think the media or the professional media has such an important role in getting their language right and putting good content out. I really do. Yeah, I mean, you know, you, you think about this, certainly in my, in my experience, you know, you, you think about your your language very, very carefully, a bit like lawyers do, actually. I mean, you weigh and measure your your words. It doesn't mean you don't get it wrong at times, because of course you do. My best stories as a journalist always came from practitioners, people involved in a particular area of law. And I always knew they were a brilliant early warning system because they knew of issues, malfunctions, problems, you know, mm. before they hit the mainstream media. Yeah. So I would make a point of going and visiting lots of firms of solicitors and barristers chambers. And because I knew that if I could get that information first, then I can get it out into the mainstream media. So it's very important. I think the people at the, you know, the coalface, as it were, practitioners and people involved do alert journalists to, you know, things that they feel are, are, you know, are not working, not in the public interest, could be improved and should be improved. And then it's up to the journalist to find a way of telling those, getting that information out and telling those stories. Well, I know you're heavily involved in getting the story out about no fault divorce at the moment. So thank you for that. (laughs) Where can people find out more about the law change, Clive? Well, um, they can. (laughs) I think Amicable has produced a very good uh, guide to the new law. I mean, lots of obviously family law firms will have guidance on, on their websites. As you say, there's a government website. There are all sorts of organizations resolution which is a big uh, big organization family lawyers you know all of these are places where you can go and find out more about it and of course on april the 6th there will be a lot of coverage i mean there are some obviously huge news stories at the moment ukraine of course being the, being the biggest one but this is a very important domestic story it, it affects you know more than 100,000 couples every year in england and wales uh, get divorced so this is a, a very important story and there will be a lot of coverage i hope good coverage that provides very good information and explanations of how how the system's changing brilliant and where can people find out more about you and what you're up to, Clive? <laughs> Talk to my mother. She knows everything. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. She still holds your diary. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I don't actually have a website. So if I'm working on something like, the, you know, you mentioned the, the Duke, the film, then I tend to put out a tweet about it. And what's your Twitter handle? I'm at Coleman CR. Okay, brilliant. And of course, you can find me on Twitter too. I'm at K underscore daily. And you can hear about new podcast episodes by following at divorce underscore podcast. And if you've enjoyed this episode and you'd like to subscribe to more, then please visit the divorcepodcast.com. Clive, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you all for listening. Mm-hmm.